Okay, here we go. Psalms for Beginners, that's the name of the, uh, the series. This is lesson number nine in that series. Title of this lesson, The Assurance, The Assurance Psalms. Um, as I said last week, a lot of the Psalms and categories of the Psalms, we said nine categories, reflect the, uh, the reaction that a person has when contemplating their, re, uh, their, um, uh, their experience in their relationship with God. In other words, a lot of the Psalms are written as a response to the experience that an individual has had with, uh, with God. For example, questioning, uh, questions rather concerning conduct. You know, how, what does the righteous man do and, and, and who is worthy to worship God? You know, the, these are questions people ask themselves in the form of Psalms, the wisdom Psalms, um, awe, the feeling of awe as one uh, observed God's creation or uh, contemplated God's word. They wrote about how they felt when they had these spiritual experiences, the joy of the experience of worship, not the joy of, you know, uh, of worshiping, although there are Psalms like that, the joy that they received just contemplating actually going to Jerusalem and worshiping God. Psalms were written about that particular experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Psalms um, resonate uh, with us even three centuries later because we can relate to the people and we can relate to their spiritual experiences today. Now in some instances the writers expressed their needs before God in times of trouble and they did so either through a listing of their troubles and crying out for help, those were the, the suffering psalms, we talked about that last time. At other times they reflected on how God had always been there during their times of uh, difficulty, providing protection and guidance for themselves as individuals and as people. Uh, the psalms that lift up God's name as protector and guide these psalms are called assurance psalms. That's the category that we're going to be looking at tonight, assurance psalm. And of course, you know, the classic assurance psalm, probably the best known psalm, best known scripture actually uh, in all of history is Psalm 23. As I say, it is the classic assurance psalm and also the best known of all the psalms in history. It is timeless in its beauty, in its message, and its message is easily understood in every age and at every age, old or young, no matter what language you speak, no matter what social class you come from, everyone can relate to Psalm 23. Of course, it describes the assurance that one has from God, and it uses two images of God, one as shepherd and one as host. Okay, let's look at the shepherd imagery first. Of course, this is a psalm written by David. It is a natural imagery for David to use since not only he was a shepherd at the beginning when he was a young man, but he came from a people who had been shepherds for generations. I mean, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were all shepherds and they acknowledged this to the Egyptian Pharaoh uh, when they migrated to Egypt, they said, we're shepherds, that's what we do. Now, the shepherd's work was all encompassing for his sheep, since these animals we know were the most helpless of animals. They're unable to defend themselves or to care for themselves. Interesting thing about Palestinian shepherds they were especially caring for their flocks in that they led the sheep and walked in front of them and did not drive them from the rear. They, uh, among other things, scouted fresh grazing uh, areas for them and also made sure that the grass was young and fresh, not dried up or weed filled or having poisonous herbs. That's how sheep are that helpless. They also, uh, as part of their work, brought them out in the morning, protected, watered them in the day, led them back to the sheepfold at the evening. I mean, shepherds, especially at the time of David, literally lived 
with their flocks. So it was a you know, all consuming task. You didn't just you know, leave the sheep and then go do your other job and then come back. You know, they weren't like uh, other types of animals. You practically lived with them. And so that's a little bit of background about Palestinian shepherds, shepherds at the time of uh, David, all consuming task. And so David writes this psalm using the shepherd as the main image. So let's read a familiar passage, of course. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So David, the shepherd from a nation of shepherds, declares that God is his shepherd and by extension fulfills this protective role with the nation as well. Not just his shepherd, everybody's shepherd. Now the word Lord here is the term Jehovah, God. It suggests the quality of the shepherd in that he is eternal, all powerful, capable of complete care for his flock. Now the metaphor of a shepherd as protector uh, was a very common one uh, in those times. David states confidently that with the Lord as his shepherd, he will not be left wanting. His needs and the needs of all the flock will always be met by the great shepherd. Verses two to four, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So in these few verses, David outlines some of the things that the great shepherd does and will do for him. For example, God will provide the things that I need, he says. The pastures, you know, for a shepherd, <laughs> needing the pasture, finding the pasture uh, was, uh, was important. And so using the metaphor of the pasture, David is giving across the idea, you know, God will provide the things, you know, the sheep need pastures, you know, but the human beings, they need clothing, they need food, they need a place to stay, they need protection, they need comforting. So God will provide all of these things. God will provide peace of mind, the still waters, imagery for peace of mind. It's amazing, you know, when, you, when, you, when you read the, um, about Saul, King Saul, and when he began to be depressed and to fall into his you know, madness, what did he do? Uh, that he, his, 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 you know, his subordinates suggested that they find somebody who could play music. And that's how David, of course, entered the court. Find somebody who played music. And when you're down and when you're going through that, well, you know, we'll play the music. It'll make you feel better. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> you know, a, nothing wrong with music, obviously. But none of his subordinates said, O oh king, please live forever. Can I humbly suggest that you go to God in prayer <laughs> for your comfort? Could I recommend that you retire to your royal chambers by yourself and we'll make sure that you're not disturbed? that you might contemplate God's word for a time and find healing there? Same thing today, what do people do? I'm down, I'm depressed, you know, I got to get away. I'm, you know, I'm going to go to you know, whatever uh, online and find some music. Same thing. David says, God provides peace of mind. It's a gift. He leads you to it. He also says God will provide regeneration, restoring the soul, restoring righteousness. And, and, and how will God do, you know, this is the what that David said, this is what God will do. Provide what I need, provide peace of mind, regenerate me, restore me, this is the what. And how will he do this? Well, he will, he will do this by guiding me in the right ways. 
He will lead me. I will not lead myself. He will lead me. And so God will provide protection through life's problems. The shadow of death that he mentions, the shadow of death isn't death itself, but rather the fear of death and the signs of death that we see in this fallen and sinful world. It's everywhere, right? Just turn on the, you know, we went, you know, yeah, thank you for saying how, how was your holiday. And we had a wonderful holiday, even though it rained, but it didn't matter, we still enjoyed ourselves. And I think one of the things that, that, that contributed to that, and it wasn't a rule or anything, I just decided, no newspapers, no news, no TV, no, no, nothing, I don't want to know it. If they bomb us, I'll figure, it'll get to me. <laughs> you know, the mushroom will get to me. No news, nothing. Just read a book. Sit there and simply enjoy the beautiful surroundings. Go find something good to eat and take your time eating. You know, pretty decadent, you know? To go have lunch at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Boy, you know. Sit there and just eat and yeah, more coffee, sure, go ahead. We see the signs of death all around us, on the news, on the internet, in our families. I mean, you know, we begin every worship service, how, pretty much? by reporting the signs of death that have been evident in our congregation. This one is sick, this one is near death, this one has an accident, this one's cancer has returned. What are those things? Well, they're simply reminders that we live and we die. So we are always living in the shadow of death. And even though, David says, even though I see these things and the shadow of death crosses over into my life, he says, I will not fear because my shepherd will be there to protect and strengthen me. Why is that? Because there's so many things in the world that argue against our faith. Our faith says, you know, if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. Our faith says that Jesus will not lose anyone. All of those who come to Him, He will resurrect on the last day. Our faith says that. But our actual experience day after day is what? <laughs> well, it's the shadow of death all day long. We see it in the mirror first thing when we get up in the morning and we look in there to you know, shave or put on our makeup. You know. Wow, I'm not getting any younger. So against this wall of arguing, telling us that our faith isn't true, David says here, God will protect that faith. He will enable me to walk and to live with hope and with a strong faith, regardless of the, quote, shadow of death. He says, the rod and the staff, you know, they comfort me. Rod and staff here may be the same thing used in two different, two different ways. It's a literary device, metonymy. It's called metonymy, you know, when you substitute a word for another word. So the rod could be to protect against attack, or the rod could be the staff that you know, helps you, supports you. And David says that God's word is the rod that protects me against what? Against believing that the shadow of death is the final thing. And the word of God is the staff that supports me when I walk, as I go through life. It guides me, it tells me how I should act which way to go, how am I going to make my decisions, what are going to be my priorities. So David sees God as his shepherd, providing for his physical needs, his peace of mind, the salvation of his soul, 
as well as the protection and support that he needs through life's difficult times. So that's the imagery of God as shepherd in this poem. In verses five and six, we see the second image, and that is God as host. So David changes the imagery and he sees the assurance that God provides as that of a host and no longer as a shepherd. So let's read through that. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. So the generous host of this era was anxious to please his guest, uh, did not see hospitality as a burden, but actually as a graceful act that blessed his guest and also his own household. In this time, the host provided you know, several pleasantry, no, it's not the good words, uh, special uh, welcoming things, if you wish. Not only the food to eat, but also washed the feet of his guests. As we know, in those times, sandals, dirty roads, washing of the feet to clean them so that they could enter in to the house. Also, ointment for his guests, a drop on the head as a sign of welcome. In addition to this, the host was also responsible for the protection of his guest. The tradition was the protection was to last as long as the food remained in the body. Two days, that was the idea. The food stays in the body two days. We read about Lot, right, in Genesis. He was ready to give up his own daughters to protect the guests that the people in the town wanted to attack. So with God as his host, David is presented with a feast, the cup overflowing, a feast, and blessings, that's the anointing, despite his enemies and problem. In other words, God can bless us despite the shadow of death. I keep coming back to that. We keep trying to eliminate any sign of the shadow of death and think if I can just eliminate every sign of the shadow of death, you know, don't talk, I don't want to hear, you know, we think we go around doing that, you know. If we could just eliminate that, but that's not the way to arrive at peace of mind by creating some sort of artificial bubble we live in that, that, that removes every sign of the shadow of death in our lives. Impossible to do anyways. Peace of mind is a gift that God gives us. We, we, don't, we don't learn it in a book. We don't go practice, every, every Tuesday night from seven to nine, I go to the whatever, the peace of mind uh, gymnasium uh, to learn how to do it. He gives it to us as a gift. When we count our blessings, we usually see that they outnumber our problems. The idea is that the light of Christ is brighter than the shadow of death. The light of Christ is brighter than the shadow of death. That's not how we eliminate it, that's how we cope with it. Verse six, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So with God as his shepherd and host, David is assured that, first of all, he will be blessed throughout his life. Not necessarily with wealth or power, but with the assurance that God's goodness and mercy will be evident to him in all that he sees. And despite trouble and sin, God's love will always be present in his life. You know, for Christians, I go back to that saying, if we continually seek the light of Christ in our lives, it will outshine the shadow of death. David was assured that God wanted to bless him. Unfortunately, many times we think, oh, I hope God, please don't be mean to me. You know, don't, 
Don't hold back to me. We have this idea of God like He's, you know, I, you know God has just so, many, so much to give, you know, and He has to parcel it out. He's not cheap, God. He's not a cheapskate. Unlimited resources. Our problem sometimes is the cup, which is our heart, the cup that we offer to receive them is so small. The prayer we need to make to enlarge in that cup, God, please show me how to love more. Show me how to love more. And as I learn how to love more, my heart gets bigger. And as my heart gets larger, it is able to receive more from God. That's, that's, that's how you know, spiritual mechanics work. If you open the engine of the spiritual motor, that, that's how it works. All those commands, you know, love your brother, love your enemy, you know, do good to those who, you know, you're thinking, if you only see that as a command, well then you're under the law, you don't get it. Those are instructions on how to open up the heart, how to expand your capacity for loving others. And as you, as you expand your capacity to love others, God is able to bless you more and more and more. And David says also his assurance, he is assured that he will always be in the presence of God. He will always be part of God's flock. He will always be welcome at his table. Isn't that what we're looking for? Isn't that, aren't those the words we want to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome, you're here at last. All right, so there's the classic Psalm 23. Surely more can be said, but a bit of a review of that. Let's go over to Psalm 46, shall we? If you, you prefer following along in your Bible. Psalm 46. Psalm 46 is a psalm that sees God not as a shepherd or a host, but sees God as a refuge. Some say this, Psalm 46 and not Psalm 18, is the inspiration for the hymn written by Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God. You know that song? Based on Psalm uh, 46, God. That's number 10, by the way, in our Songs of Faith and Praise, if you want to look that up later. So this psalm is divided into three sections. So let's look at section one, verses one to three. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, uh, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. So God is our refuge, he says, in life's gravest crises. And the author describes uh, cataclysmic natural events, but says that despite these, one whose refuge is God will not be afraid. Well, you know, he's describing it in a generic way. Mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Wow, imagine that would be a terrible thing. Or, well, what about if uh, your husband of 47 years dies? That's, I, I would think that's pretty equal to the mountain slipping into the sea as a cataclysm in your life. That the waters roar and foam, all of a sudden somebody steals your identity and bankrupts you, and you have to spend a year and, and a, tremendous amount, a tremendous amount of money regaining your, you know, your banking and all that business. That would equal the waters roaring and foaming, wouldn't it? So he's using these natural disasters as a way of conveying uh, you know, catastrophes in life. 
and he says, if God is my refuge, whatever the cat catastrophe, I I'll feel safe. Verses four to seven, he says, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. So God is our refuge in the presence of our immediate enemies. He describes Jerusalem as not only the place where God is and His people, but also the target for attack by the enemy. And we know this is so, if we read through the Old Testament, how many times has the city of Jerusalem, or was the city of Jerusalem attacked by all kinds of people? And so the defender of the city, he says, who destroys the enemy is God Himself. The idea being that those who are close to God will be defended by God against any and all enemies and will be defended successfully. And here, you know, pause, because we're thinking, well, I know, I've known some Christian people, you know, I mean, they weren't defended. We, we saw you know, a terrible video of uh, you know, the Islamic uh, terrorists uh, leading out a, you know, a whole line of Christians, I think they were all men, Christian men you know, dressed in orange suits with, uh, with uh, uh, black bags over their heads who were then decapitated. Somehow those men and what he's saying here, is, uh, that doesn't jive. And I believe what David is, or the author is, is talking about here is not, he will make you win the war. I think it's more along the lines where Jesus is saying, don't fear the one who can only destroy the body and then has no other power. You, you be afraid of the one who can destroy your body and then put your soul into hell, and that's God. And so those unfortunate believers who were killed lost their lives, the promise that David makes here is that, but you don't lose your soul. God is with you. God will help you maintain your faith even at this particular point, which will give you a lasting victory. In verse eight to 11, he continues, he says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. I've mentioned to you before that the word Selah at the end there is either uh, instructions for the choir or the musicians, either a musical type of notation, or other scholars believe that it is an indication or an instruction to the reader to simply pause and consider and contemplate what has just been said. So you can go with either one of those. So here he says, God is our refuge among the nations. Not only does God protect from the enemy, political, moral, spiritual, but His victory should be assigned to all the nations that they should cease rejecting God and His people and come to the Lord. Because they tried to destroy the church, didn't they? In the first century, and in the second century, and then in the third century, and the fourth century, and the fifth, and the sixth, shall I keep going till the 20th century? They continue to try to destroy the church. They continue to try to, to, uh, uh, to deny the uh, uh, accuracy and the inspiration of the Bible. The smartest men, the smartest women, the most gifted ones have tried to destroy its credibility and yet here we are, still teaching it, and yet here we are, still bringing our children and, and teaching them from an early age so that they will be wise unto salvation when that time comes. 
And here we are training the next generation saying, you know, we're expecting you to be faithful. We're passing on the torch to you. Be faithful. And, and, and we're training you to pass it on to the next generation until the Lord returns. Somehow we just keep doing that. And the world in all of its might can't extinguish that flame. So this passage here looks to a point beyond even this world and into the next where the author sees God as the refuge against death itself. Note in verses seven and 11, these two form a refrain which is repeated twice in the poem and it refers to the threefold title of God. Who is the refuge for us? Well, first of all, the Lord of hosts is a refuge for us. Here the Lord of hosts is God's title of divine power. That's a title. The Lord of hosts. What are the hosts? Well, they're the millions of angels. They're the armies of God. He is the Lord of all the armies of heaven. His title of divine power to the answer, who is our refuge? Who is our refuge? Number two, the God of Jacob. This is his title of covenant, his covenant relationship with Israel. This is the God in human history. Who is our refuge? Who is he? Well, in heaven, he's the Lord of hosts. Here on earth, you may know him. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of Jesus. He's the God of the apostles and the gospel. He's the God of the church. He's that God. He's that refuge. Interesting to note that pagan gods had no covenants with individuals. This is how Jehovah was different and differentiated from these others. You know, the Baal worship. Remember we talked about the Baal worship, the, the local gods in each of the towns. Baal had no covenant with any individual, not, none of the Molech had no covenant, no promises with any of, the, uh, any of the people. This is what was so distinctive about the God of Israel. He had a covenant with the people. He had a covenant to the point where you know, the, the, the speculation, the regulations were actually written down. His responsibilities, their responsibilities. His promises uh, and, and their response to his promises. No other religion had that. So who is the God of refuge in history? Well, he's the, you know, of all the gods they've talked about here on earth, this God, the God of Jacob. And then who is the refuge? The Lord of hosts with us, Emmanuel. Emmanuel is with us. This is his name and it suggests the substance of his promise and why we can feel assured. God is with us. The pagan gods, they weren't with you, you had to go to them. You had to do things to approach them. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God who became flesh in Jesus Christ, He is with His people. He goes even beyond that, He is within His people. You know, in Acts 2.38, you know, when Peter says, repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've said this before. The big news there to the people who were listening wasn't that at the point of, of baptism that they, would, that they would receive forgiveness. John the Baptist preached that. That was an old sermon. That was an old idea. But at the point of baptism, you were to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Whoa, that was news. That was the fulfillment of the prophets in the Old Testament who said one day God is going to be with us. He not, is a, he not only is going to be with us, He's going to be inside of us. That was the shocking news. That was the 
you know, the thing that reverberated. They knew all about you know, baptism, forgiveness. John had preached that for several years. So had Jesus and the apostles. But that now the spirit, the eternal spirit, the spirit of the Lord of hosts is going to be dwelling permanently within us to raise us up. That was news, that was good news. So in describing God in this Psalm, the author is assured that the Lord is a refuge against life's catastrophes, life's enemies, as well as life's greatest enemy, physical death. How? Oh, through His divine power. He is a refuge because He has power and His historical proof of His love. The love he had for, the, for Israel and the continual love that he shows his church. And of course, the promise to always be with his people. No God in, every, no God in any other pagan religion made that promise to, to their people. The pagan gods, it was all about gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> gimme sacrifice. I'll tell you what, give me your firstborn. Take your firstborn baby there and throw him into the fire. Give me that. And here the God of Israel is promising always to be with his people. Ah, what a difference. All right, a couple of really quick application lessons here and then we'll, we'll close it off. A couple of lessons based on you know, these assurance psalms. Some things that we learn. Strong faith equals strong assurance. We build confidence in God's care by building our faith and we build our faith by interaction with God's word. People who are always scared of dying and scared of this and scared that they won't have enough and that, usually are not in God's word very much. You know, Paul says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. So reading and studying and understanding and memorizing and teaching and sharing and especially obeying God's word, this is what builds spiritual confidence in God's power, God's love and God's presence. That's how you do it. You want to go to the spiritual gym? Get into God's word more deeply, more often, more engagingly. And one of the pleasant results of that exercise is that you will begin to feel assured of what you believe, assured of God's care for you. Lesson number two, assurance equals peace. You see, the more confidence we have the greater peace we feel. Because peace is a feeling. Nothing in the outside world can disturb the inward peace we have when that peace is based on the assurance we have through faith. I have assurance through faith. The stronger my faith is, the stronger my assurance is, the stronger my assurance is, the greater my peace to face whatever. And then number three, peace engenders courage, patience, long suffering, and joy. Seeing ourselves facing life's many difficulties with courage and patience and long suffering confirms that our faith is sincere and true. It's like, wow, this thing happened, whatever it is, okay, this bad thing happened and somehow I didn't fall apart and somehow I didn't, you know, it was difficult and it was painful, and that, but I'm still here, Lord, I'm still here. And Lord, I saw how you helped me through this. Thank you, Lord. And then the realization of this fact produces joy, the spiritual equivalent of happiness. Listen to this, I only have a minute left. 
The difference between the two, you know, joy and happiness, the difference between the two is that happiness begins and ends with earthly life and death. Joy, however, goes on forever. The non-believer can be happy, but that's it. We'll never know joy. Joy is a spiritual experience. To experience joy while in this earthly body is to preview what life will be like in heaven. And once you've tasted it, there's no going back. You are ready to lay down your life for Christ if it comes to that. If you taste what joy is like, it's like <laughs> you say what the apostles said, look, go ahead, you know, beat me, whip me, kill me, what can I tell you? I saw what I saw. I can't unsee what I saw. And for us today, I know what I know. I can't unknow what I know. I can't undo the joy that, that I've experienced. So if you're going to shoot me, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't unknow and unfeel what I have learned and what I have experienced in Christ. Okay, so Psalm 23, and what was the other one? Psalm 146, those are two of those. Thank you very much for your attention, I appreciate it.